Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me today. I'm very excited to be talking to you guys about reactivity in fearful dogs and how enriching jobs can build them confidence. My name is Chantal Atkinson. I specialize in dog reactivity. Um, this is one of my favorite behaviors to, to work with. Um, just seeing the outcomes um, is, is beautiful. Um, so I'm very excited to, to move forward with this. Um, though, please bear with me. I'm not always the greatest speaker um, when I'm not actually visually seeing people um, and, and or people talking to me. So please bear with me while I go through this slide with you. Um, I hope that I can put a new perspective into, um, into your guys. So let's get started. The road to recovery, how to improve your fearful dog by enriching their lives. Um, this is a big one. Recovering from trauma um, or, you know, anything that's kind of going on in your life that's hard, it's challenging to overcome. Um, it's mentally breaking and it's mentally puts a huge toll on you. Um, and physically, it, if anyone has ever had trauma in your life, you know the, that the road to recovery is, is hard to overcome. Um, and you need sometimes people to give you a lending hand and help you get to a bright and successful future. Um, you know, it's, it's without that help sometimes you get stuck and we don't want our dogs to get stuck in that negative mind state. Um, we want to put a positive view on how they view the world and they can only do that with our help. So I'm hoping this presentation um, will help you to help your dog um, see a positive side to the world. So today what I'm going to be talking about is understanding the dog's body language. A lot of people um, have a hard time reading. So I put some pictures together um, for the most common um, body languages to look for. Finding your dog's comfort zone, that's the biggest one. Um, if, you're, if, if you're in a space that they're uncomfortable in, your dog's not gonna wanna work with you. They're gonna be so stressed out from the environment that they're in, seeing all the triggers. Um, so we're going to be talking about that um, and ways to, to help put a positive side to their triggers. Um, it's nobody likes, you know, to be negative. Um, we really want to just be positive. Um, implementing enriching jobs to boost confidence in a fearful dog is super beneficial. Um, it's it's fantastic. It is amazing to see dogs who are fearful open up when you give them a job. And I do this in all of my um, behavior consults because it's they need it. They they need to build confidence. People who lack confidence, they're they're fearful. They're you know, they have a lot going on. Um, when you build up that confidence, their, their ego and everything kind of starts to go up with them. Um, so we need to find that ways to enrich your dog's life. Um, finding your dog's motivation, that's key. Um, without having motivators, um, it's hard. And I'm not talking about trigger motivators. We don't want that. We want those fun and exciting and very high value motivators. The other biggest one um, is safety and management. A lot of people, um, a lot of people need safety tools and and control management. Um, so that is the topics we're going to be talking about today. Let's take a look at some of the different signs of communication your dog will give you. Please be aware that some of these signs are not always related to aggression. 
So body language is key to understanding your dog. In this picture uh, that you see, I'm gonna let you guys think on this. Do you think that they are playing? Um, do you think it was a play that escalated into a little tiff? Um, or was it a play that really escalated to a outbreak? Um, so think on that, take a look at the picture. And at the end of the presentation, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna actually um, talk to you about that time. Identifying the uncomfortable. First thing to do is evaluate. Really, really, really evaluate pretty much everything. Evaluate the environment, mo motivators such as the triggers, space. Think about the space that you're in and what is your dog telling you? You have to evaluate all these things to really understand your dog and to get a better point of view of where they're coming from. Uh, so first thing is body language. This here on the right, the dog has what we call an agonistic pucker um, that is often followed by resource guarding um, really towards any buddy or thing that is going around that high value uh, reinforcement. Um, so right here, uh, agonistic pucker is a nice C shape of the mouth with uh, really nice uh, wrinkles in the muzzle. Um, you can see here the brows um, have gone over. The dog's pupils, if you look closely, are pretty dilated. Um, the, the ears are pretty tucked in, um, though it can be hard to tell with the picture. Um, and of course, the teeth. So usually the C shape um, of a agonistic pucker is followed by resource guarding. Um, <coughs> teeth bearing um, is not always a reactive response. Um, it could be submissive grins. Um, usually you see those in, in um, you know, golden retrievers and things like that. Um, so sometimes the, the submissive grins can be misleading with teeth bearing. Um, however, these can also be followed by play and other behaviors. Take into consideration the first picture you've seen. Yawning, a formally known signal, though take into context the different yawns. When is it being used? Are you seeing more frequent, frequent yawns? Um, maybe you're not seeing frequent yawns. Um, however, if you are seeing a lot of yawning, um, it can definitely be stress related. So again, evaluate the environment you're in. Um, you might have to modify that to uh, bring down that stress in your dog. Um, however, yawning can be another precursor. Um, it's pretty low on the scale, though um, it can be escalated if you're not if you're not understanding your dog. Whale eyes uh, is often another one. Um, it, it can be a displacement behavior, often accompanied by other body language. You see it most often. It doesn't always mean that whale eyeing often leads to a bite reaction. Subtle signals, stress, or the dog doesn't want to engage in an activity um, is when you usually see uh, the whites of the eyes in the dog. Pupil dilation is another sig signal, um, though taken into consideration the breed. Um, so in these pictures, uh, the first one with the puppy whale eyeing, um, we don't know what's going on to, to um, identify the behavior here, though um, it gives you a good uh, definition of what whale eyeing looks like. 
Uh, the bottom picture with a girl, there can be uh, some uh, signals that could be, um, you know, that I'd really be leery about, um, such as the lip licking, the whale eyes. If you look closely, the pupils look pretty dilated. Um, the ears are pinched. Uh, the dog kind of looks a little uncomfortable. Um, though again, I don't know the background of what's going on, um, but maybe the dog just doesn't like being touched. Maybe it's the space that they're in. Um, maybe it's whatever the girl is doing um, that the dog is uncomfortable about. But it gives you an idea of what whale eyeing looks like. Curled or pinched ears. Not all dogs do the pinched ears, as you can see this one doing. Um, it's an avoidance behavior, often followed by a guilty look. Again, what this pup's doing. Um, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> it's usually often followed by um, doing something naughty, uh, whether that be your dog um, decided to have a heyday shredding your couch and you came home and it was, you know, a disaster. Um, or your dog decided to get into the garbage and it got all over the place. Um, most times you will see either the curled ears um, or the pinched ears, followed by a head down, the dog looking up. Um, you know, your dog is going to walk slowly. Sometimes that, that butt is kind of tucked with a really stiff, um, slow wig. Uh, a lot of people think that this is a cute and funny behavior. It's really not. Um, it, it, the dog is very uncomfortable. Um, you are the reason as to why they actually decided to have a heyday destroying the house. So think, why did my dog do this? What did I do today with my dog um, that could have prevented this? Um, disaster. Was the walk not long enough? Um, did I take my dog for a run? Do I need to do more mental stimulation? Um, really, really, really um, take a look at that before you scold your dog for doing something that you could avoid it. Um, that is their way of saying that they're bored. They need something to do, so they decided to entertain themselves by potentially destroying your place. So no, it's not a funny and cute behavior. It's an avoidance behavior. So again, curled or pinched ears, it's, it's, a, it's an uncomfortable uh, behavior. Lip licking, often overlooked, but can be a displacement or stress behavior. Um, if you see more frequent licking, um, sometimes it's used uh, when your dog is uncomfortable um, or stimulus is really close. Um, it's, 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 it is often really overlooked. Um, so think if your dog is licking their lips frequently, um, again, evaluate the environment you're in. However, lip licking is also often used. Um, to eat, drink, or if they just ran, um, you know, had a fun day outside. Um, however, it can be a precursor. So take a look at the whole picture. Spatula tongue can be used in a stressful environment or used around a stimulus the dog isn't entirely comfortable around. Um, so you see here um, that, you know, if your dog is stressed. So this one on the right, um, you don't know what is going on, but ears back, um, heavily panting. I would say this dog just had a really good exercise. Um, however, um, this can also be uh, an indication of stress. So really heavy panting, ears back, um, pupils dilation, like take take um, take those into consideration as well. Um, 
to the left, we have a happy dog. There's a really nice picture of a, what we would call a spatula tongue. Um, so I would say it's a hot day. That's why the dog's panting. Um, again, we don't know what's actually going on behind the picture, but really do take into consideration hot days. Dog can be thirsty, just um, had a good exercise. Um, but again, you know, if you see that your dog is really panting, really scanning the area, ears back, pupils dilated, take a look at the environment. They could, they could be stress and it, it might be something that you need to modify. Distance and comfort. Finding the distance to being comfortable. Um, this is a big one, a really, really big one. Um, a lot of times what people do um, is walks just get too stressful um, and too complicated because it doesn't matter where you go, there's going to be triggers that your dog is going to react to. So people resort to, um, they resort to taking their dogs away and removing them from walks and not giving them the exercise that they need. Um, while that can sometimes be good, um, it's often not a good idea because uh, your dog still needs some sort of enrichment. They, they still need to get out there and be a dog and, and live life. So removing them from those situations completely, you're, you're really putting an avoidance to it and it's not going to help the, the behavior. Um, <clears throat> So this is where distance um, comes into play. So comfort zone. Dogs who are uncomfortable around their triggers will often not take treats, pay attention to you, push themselves away, or react. Um, this is a really, really big one. If your dog is uncomfortable, they're not going to take treats from you. doesn't matter high, how high value it is. Um, calling their name, pulling them into you, it's, it's not going to help them uh, to pay attention to you. Um, you need to find where they're comfortable in working with you and around their triggers. Um, if, if you, you know, if your dog sees, say their trigger is another dog, um, and five blocks away, your dog sees their trigger, but isn't really totally engaging at that time. Um, but say four blocks away, your dog starts to get a little bit more uncomfortable. They're presenting a little bit more body language. You're starting to creep up to um, them going over threshold. So I would go back to five blocks and I would start, um, I would start rewarding them for engaging and disengaging in their, tr in their trigger. Um, they're not reacting. They're still kind of going about their day. They know that trigger's there, but they're, they're, they're comfortable. They don't have to tell that trigger off. Um, so keeping that five, five block radius um, is, is what your dog needs. If, if that's what it takes, if that's how far um, they are, uh, being comfortable with with their triggers, then you need to work in your dog's comfort zone. Um, if you are trying to work with your dog who's starting to go over threshold um, and you're trying to reward them, it, you're really kind of just helping them put a more negative picture on their triggers. Um, so, so don't work when they're kind of going over threshold because again they're not going to they're not going to pay attention to you they won't often take treats because they're so focused on telling that trigger that they're uncomfortable stay away hence why they lunge bark um, they may do circles whichever right they're trying to do a fight or flight mode um, so really really work and find your dog's comfort zone um, it's a hard one, um, but really, really do try to work on that because it's just going to make it's just going to make things a little bit more easier for you for control. Um, it's going to be it's, your dog is going to be be comfortable. You're not kind of just throwing them in with the wolves type deal. Um, 
so again, when you're working in their comfort zone, um, that's when I would be rewarding them for engaging and disengaging on their triggers. Um, be frequent with rewards. Don't be stingy. Um, make sure they're extremely high value, um, the, the treats, uh, because if, if you're giving your dog kibble, they get kibble all the time. Breakfast, lunch, dinner. Uh, it's boring. I mean, if, if I was to get chicken for the rest of my life, um, I would do anything to not have chicken again. <laughs> so um, really find um, that motivator, what motivates your dog um, to, to stay engaged with you, to be able to disengage and engage on the trigger. Um, but we don't want an engagement where the dog is very, um, like they're intensely staring. We don't want that. So at that point, your dog is kind of starting to creep up to going over threshold. Um, so take it back a notch. Um, we want that nice engage and disengage with you rewarding instantly. Um, so again, finding that high value reinforcement um, and using it. Switch it up all the time. Um, like don't, you know, like one minute you might use cheese. That really works. Next day or next training session, try hot dogs. Like switch up the reinforcement. It's going to keep things a lot more interesting. Your dog isn't going to get as much uh, bored of it. Um, and they're not going to be so focused on their triggers because you have something more higher in value than that trigger is offering them. Uh, so you're only going to get that when working in your dog's comfort zone. Painting a picture with rewards is kind of what I was just talking about. Triggers are scary for fearful dogs and you are there to help them repaint that picture. Reinforcement should be higher in value than their trigger. So find that motivation. Um, if your dog is extremely ball obsessed, um, use that as a reward sometimes for when they engage or disengage, play with them around their triggers, again, in their comfort zone. Um, if they really, really love food and they're motivated with food, use different types of, of foods. Again, they have to be higher in value or your dog is not going to be uh, focused on you. They're going to be so more focused on their trigger. Um, so really find <clears throat> a high value um, motivator and work with it, use it, have fun with your dog. Um, the, the one thing to, that you can do too um, is take your dog to the sidelines. For example, if there's a baseball game going on and your dog is a little bit triggered by um, people, people running, um, loud noises, or all of those things together, um, take them to the sidelines. So again, in their comfort zone and let them watch. That is so good for them. Um, just letting them watch and having them evaluate the environment themselves is really good for them. Um, it gives them, uh, you know, who they are, what are they doing? Um, you know, they're able to relax because they're in their, they're, they're comfortable. They're, you've, you've put them in a com comfortable state. Uh, you put them in a comfortable environment. Um, you haven't really pushed them, uh, you know, going close to the, the, the baseball game. Um, so having your dog watch from the sidelines is, is great. And in that time, make it rewarding. They're watching, perfect. Play with your dog. Again, if find that motivator. Your dog loves to play ball, play ball. Um, you know, give them treats. Just really, um, really make it fun for them. Um, because being around triggers and sometimes seeing them, it's hard. Our anxiety starts to rise and um, you're there to help keep that down. So painting a picture with rewards. Job seeking, uh, enrichment for confidence. I love, love, love this. And I 
try to implement this in all of um, my aggression cases uh, because it, it's amazing to see when you have a fearful dog, um, they're, they're lacking a lot of confidence in themselves. Uh, and it's just like us too. Um, those who lack a lot of confidence in themselves, um, it's very, very hard for them to get out and be open. And, and that's exactly like our dogs. So um, give them something to do. So dogs need some form of a job um, to decompress, working their mind and nose mentally versus running, jumping, or climbing physically. Find, again, what motivates your dog and use it. Um, so in some of my eight cases, I might do nose work. I might do a little bit of parkour. Um, I might do, you know, some form of sniffing, um, going up and over things uh, is usually what I try to do in, in my sessions with, with fearful dogs. And it's amazing to see them completely open up. Um, it, it's, it's beautiful. They, they start to build confidence in themselves. Um, they want to work with you more because you have found something that they're really enjoying. Um, so really, really open up your minds, find some type of job that will help your dog to decompress. Um, so after, if you've, you know, you've gone for a walk, um, and you're working on their triggers, but something somewhere came out of nowhere, spooked your dog, um, you, you'll have a setback. Um, and, and those will happen. Setbacks will happen all the time. Um, but once you're, you're, you're done, give your dog a job to help decompress, to help, um, wind them down. Um, because that, that was, you know, running into a trigger like that can be, can be scary. And, um, and, and at that point, like I say, it brings you back to, it sets you back, um, so give your dog something really enriching um, to help build confidence. Because when you build confidence in yourself, um, my God, you just, you're a whole new person. Um, and, and it's just like our dogs. Again, just finding what motivates your dog. Is it ball, playing tug of war, learning new and fun games, going on hikes, swimming? All of these things are good um, to decompress. Uh, so find what motivates your dog. Use it. Use it for, for training. Um, just all these things. You have to find, you just have to find what motivates your dog. Because when you do, you're going to be working as a team. When you understand your dog, your dog's going to understand you. And you're going to just be a beautiful pair. Safety and management huge. Uh, safety precautions um, is to always watch your dog's body language. I Every time I take my dogs out for a walk, I am always staring at them. I very rarely actually look at the environment um, because my dog's body language is going to tell me more um, than, than the body, I mean, than the environment that they're in. So if I'm at a you know, big open field and I'm walking my dog and there's nobody around, but all of a sudden my dog starts to get a little bit tense, ears are a little bit perky. Um, you know, they sense something, they hear something, they potentially see something that I don't. Um, and next thing you know, maybe there's a trigger and I just didn't see them, but they they started to sense it before me. So they're going to tell me a lot more about how they feel versus the environment um, at that time. So always watch your dog's body language because they're going to tell you when they're uncomfortable in that environment and at that point modify. Um, again, uh, the environment you're in is going to determine um, 
your your safety measures. Uh, too many high triggers can um, be not not a good place. Uh, you know, you're just asking for a reaction to happen that could potentially be a liability. And we don't want that. We want everybody to be safe. <clears throat> we want you to be safe. <clears throat> and uh, especially our dogs. We want our dogs to be safe. We don't want anything to happen to them. Um, and we want them to be comfortable. So again, environment. Uh, your dog's arousal level is going to be another huge one. A dog that is very overstimulated um, can often become very um, mouthy or barky, things like that. Um, so you want to bring down that uh, a notch. Barriers and layered barriers. Um, sometimes you'll need to do that uh, depending on depending on your dog's reactivity. Um, and first and foremost, everything, your safety, dog safety, and others' safety. Um, if, you, if you are going to a park where you often see dogs off leash, I wouldn't be bringing my dog there anymore. Um, again, you're just asking for, for trouble. Um, <clears throat> tools and, and barriers. Exercise pens can be used as barriers and to block visual. Same with baby gates. Um, you know, if your dog is reactive um, towards people who come in the house um, or other dogs, or maybe your dog um, now is having an issue with um, another household dog. Uh, these these <clears throat> barriers will will help. Uh, you can put blankets over them, things like that to kind of block the visual. Um, spray deterrence, um, halt or pet safe. This is for your safety. Um, air sprays and air horns. Um, those are good. Those are all good little tools um, to have on hand. It, for your safety and for your dog's safety. If a reactive dog is loose, coming at you, um, or, you know, it, air horns um, are sometimes a good way to break up a fight. Um, so some of these things are really good to have on hand. A break stick, though um, a break stick is, it's, it's definitely handy if you have a dog that, um, that is uh, not in control. Um, though at that point, definitely seek help. Um, if, if you have a dog that is very um, reactive, that you would need such a thing. But all these things are really good to have on hand. Um, it just helps with, um, you know, getting dogs to stay away from you and breaking up fights um, and, uh, preventing um, any further breakouts. Collars, muzzles, and harnesses. Um, this is what we call like a two-point contact. Um, those are really good. If you, if you have a reactive dog and a very strong one that you have a hard time controlling um, or handling when out on walks, you want to have a two-point contact. Um, so that is where a uh, collar, um, where a clip is attached to the collar and harness, uh, a clip that is attached to either a gentle leader to the collar or um, a two point harness. When picking muzzles, um, they should be comfy muzzles and ones that you should be able to feed through. Um, but definitely if you have a dog that is very powerful um, and you've had a lot of uh, reactive encounters where the dog has actually bit somebody. Um, yeah, two point contact would be would be very, very good um, for safety and control. Changing your mindset uh, changes the whole picture too. Um, this is very, very big. Don't tense up and pull in. So when you tense up and pull your dog in, you've just set your dog up. They know what's coming and therefore you, you're, you're gonna cause a reaction. 
No yelling or scolding your dog. When your dog is about to go over threshold, don't yell at them. It, it's not gonna work. You're again, just setting your dog up. Uh, when they're over threshold, scolding them during or after, again, isn't going to help. It just paints the picture more uglier. Be calm if possible. When you are calm, your dog is calm. When your dog is over threshold and you're anxiety ridden, and it's going up and up, it's going to take a long time to unwind from all of that. Um, though when you're calm and in a calm state of mind after a um, reaction, it helps to level down your dog a lot quicker. So really, really work on your mindset as well um, because your dog feels it all, your dog senses it all. Um, so when you're high in anxiety, your dog's gonna be high in anxiety. When you're calm, your dog's gonna be potentially a little bit more calmer and a lot easier to wind down after um, a trigger has passed by. The future is bright. Commitment, don't give up. Setbacks will happen, learn from them. Um, if you are, if you're walking and a dog comes out of nowhere and your dog's trigger is other dogs, um, and say this dog came around a corner unexpectedly, that's an area that um, I would, would want to work on a little bit more. So learn from that. Continue learning and improving. Uh, so improving your dog's life. Remember, it's hard being in the position your dog is in mentally. Grow as a team. When you start to understand your dog, your dog starts to understand you and you, and you becoming a team just happens. It's a beautiful thing. Um, you really, really need to understand your dog and where they're coming from. So that is all for today. Um, I thank you very much for joining me um, in and helping you understand a little bit more about uh, fearful reactivity. Um, if you have any further questions um, for answers, I will be on at six today. Um, Otherwise, uh, I will see you all later. Thank you very much for joining me.